I would ask just a few minutes to allow me to welcome you this morning and add my uh, warm welcome onto that which has already been offered. It's a very, very encouraging sight to see this many people here with us this morning. So many people who have in their minds that they are going to worship God today, that they are going to meet with people who want to do the same, that they are going to encourage each other. And I know many of you are, are visiting with us, have sought out a place maybe on your travels to be coming and meeting with saints to worship God. That speaks very highly of you. Whatever your interest in being here today, uh, that you have sought out the better part this morning, that you have sought out spiritual things. And I very much pray that the time I'm going to spend with you will be uplifting and will offer something for us to consider that might improve us as we live before God. But please know that you have, have already given a lot back to us by your presence here this morning and your interest in doing things that are going to honor our God and Father. Compare these two statements with me, if you would. The first is made by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 15. And I see now that you're not looking at that. I am on the screen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 15, the Apostle Paul says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. Compare that with what the writer says in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 15. The leech has two daughters, give and give. Those are really two polar opposite mindsets, are they not? The Apostle Paul, often a, a victim of, of hatred and jealousy and envy and oppression from so many other people, including sometimes the people that he loved and was working so hard on their behalf. We talked about that a little bit in our class hour this morning. And yet, nevertheless, his disposition through all of that was, as he describes to the saints in Corinth, I will very gladly spend and be spent. I, I, I love that phrase, spend whatever resources he might have in order to help them. Um, he would do that very gladly. On the other hand, you have the way of the leech. Never satisfied, always simply wanting something to be given to it. Give and give. Both can be applied to anything. Uh, please understand as we begin this morning, we're not talking about money. We're not talking about the, the physical resources that we might have, the, the food that I could provide to other people, whatever that might be. I guess I should say we're not talking about those things only. Any resource that we have, money is one resource, food is one resource, but some of our resources are far more precious than those things. How much value would you place on an hour of your life? I have thought that before. I talked in her first lesson this morning about long nights and that I've had some Saturday nights that felt very long and, and difficult. I have have said to Beth sometimes on a Sunday morning, I don't even know how much money I would pay to be able to sleep for two more hours today. <laughs> you know, if somebody could make me an offer, $10,000, I, I might think about it. I, I might be tempted to do that. If I could just go back to sleep for a little while. And, and you've had those weeks probably where you just think, I, I wouldn't. There's nothing I wouldn't part with to just have more time to accomplish this task or to have more time with some person that we love that time might be growing short with them. The other powerful resources that we have in our lives are our effort, our energy, the, the vitality and will that you have to accomplish a certain task. That's finite. We have a finite amount of effort that we can give or affection that we can provide to someone, the, the time that we're willing to invest in a relationship with another human being. The attention that we can give to someone else, all of those things. But remember, as we are talking about these two various ways, that they are both mindsets. It really doesn't depend on what we actually have, but it depends on the way that we think. We mention this often when we are talking about greed versus generosity, that those really don't have anything to do with a person's wealth. Some of the most generous people that you have known, probably, 
would come from all different spectrums of life. I've known extremely wealthy people who would give you anything that they had if you, if you asked, and sometimes when you don't ask, and sometimes when you try to stop them from doing that, they say, no, I, I want to help you out. And some of the most generous people I've known are, are like that widow who is giving the last two pennies that she has to rub together. She's providing for someone else. And on the flip side, haven't we seen some of the greediest people Well, when you see how wealthy they are, you understand. Well, it's because he's never done anything to help out another person in his life. And on the other hand of that, of course, some of the greediest people don't have anything, and they're striving and kicking and clawing and pushing aside whoever they can in order to maybe have those two pennies to rub together. The the circumstances don't matter. It's the mindset. And so we're investigating that mindset this morning, and I want to strongly discourage you from following that mindset painted in Proverbs chapter 30, that the leech has those two daughters, those two things that she wants, that she craves for something, for someone else to give and give. We cannot follow that path. We cannot follow that way of the leech. And I will tell you why this morning. It is, first of all, very clear that this way provides no value whatsoever to anyone else. In fact, not caring about this point is usually one of the problems in the first place. That's how you end up going down this path, because you don't care about anyone else. I don't know when people first began using the word leech as an insult. That is how we use it today, oftentimes. That guy is a leech. I don't know when that started. I, I'm thinking that it was probably in long usage by the time of Agur, who is the writer of Proverbs 30. And it continues that way. Leech, parasite, bloodsucker, hanger on, you know, all of those different terms that all really mean the same thing. None of those are good for others. When we describe someone in those terms, we're talking about someone who is harmful to another person. They take away. They don't provide any benefit. They only care about their own wants. They only care about their own needs. It's selfishness to the core. On the other hand, we have this way that Paul is proclaiming about his his own life and what he encouraged his listeners and his readers and his fellow saints to do. It is sacrificial. It is concerned chiefly with the other person. He would encourage that, for instance, in Philippians 2, aside from what we started with in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Think of Philippians 2 and verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And on several occasions would say something to the effect of, let each esteem others more highly than himself. That is not the blood-sucking leech who is just trying to say, how much can I squeeze out of these other people? How much time and attention can I pull away from you and devote none of it from myself? How much can I get out of all the people that surround me in my life and and just bleed them dry and not provide anything of myself? That's the total opposite of what Paul says we must do. Instead, what do you need? Can I provide it? Can I help? Can I be there? Can I provide this? Very stark difference between the two. But this way of the leech can't ever really be satisfied. There's no end to it. There's no time where they say, good, I got what I wanted. In fact, that's really the point of the proverb in chapter 30 of Proverbs that we begin with. That's the point. The leech always wants more. That, that's what it's saying. Give and give. The rest of the text, if you begin in the the second half of verse 15 in Proverbs 30, it continues, there are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. It says it's the grave, the barren womb, the earth that's not satisfied with water, and the fire never says enough. Those are vivid images that the Proverbs writer uses there. You, You think of a fire we're not really in the area of the country where these things are especially dangerous, but we're getting close to the season when those things will happen, maybe in California, maybe in parts out west, when one of those wildfires starts. Well, it just 
lasts for a few minutes, right? I mean, it's a fire, it eats up some land, and then it stops, right? It's satisfied. It got what it wanted. Wanted to eat up a few trees, wanted to eat up a campsite, wanted to do something like that, right? No, that, that fire just runs out of control. It goes everywhere it can. It consumes everything in its path. And he's saying, this is what some people can be like. This is what a tendency in humanity can be if we do not rein it in and put it into check and learn how to say enough. That unfillable void. Some people can never get enough attention, enough possessions, enough control over another person. They can't be filled. And I hope I am saying this morning that you know people like this. I I hope we would not say of these, we are like this. But I recognize these tendencies in myself. If you do, I, I offer them simply as means of recognizing and correcting But we can be that unfillable void at times. When will we be satisfied? How much must another person give to me? How much must I receive from the world before I can say, I've had my fill, go and help someone else out for a while? Then, of course, on the other side, there are those people like Paul. We continue to to use him as the point of contrast because it's spelled out so many times in the Scriptures. Also in the book of Philippians Think of chapter 4 and verse 11. Paul is there uh, setting up. Eventually, we'll build towards the idea of verse 13, I guess, is uh, the more often quoted on social media posts, and people uh, try to sort of live by that maxim. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and that is a useful and a powerful verse when understood in its context with what Paul is actually saying about that, that I can do all things through through Christ who strengthens me. He's not talking about being able to dunk a basketball. He's not talking about being able to pass the bar exam or whatever kind of thing it is that we're saying, well, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this as a Christian, so of course I'll succeed in it. How Paul begins there in verse 11, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Contentment. The people who give because they love and don't expect anything in return are never disappointed. If I have that attitude towards you, if I have that attitude towards my brother, that I am I am giving, again, of whatever resource it might be, my time, my money, my love, whatever it is, I am giving that to you with no strings attached. I'm giving that to you because Christ wants me to and because I want to do it. No matter what you do in response, I'm satisfied. I've completed my part of the transaction. I have done what I need to do and what I should do and what I want to do, and I'm not going to be left disappointed in that. And that is a a wonderful counterpoint to that way of the leech that says, I'm going to try to get what I want out of you, and no matter what you do, I'm not going to be satisfied with it. I'll never say enough. We must learn contentment. We must learn that that we can be okay with what we have. We can be content with whatever state we find ourselves in. That's very needful in our society especially. Think of what people, what kind of people or or specific folks. Who do you love the most in your life? Who, Who do you like to spend time around? the most? Who are you most willing to go and help out? You know, you sort of have those degrees of friendship. Uh, I'd, I'd go pick this guy up at the airport. I'd go help this guy move. I'd go, you know, watch the dog for a little while, whatever it might be. It's those things kind of ramp up in importance. Who, who are the people that, that occupy that top spot that you say, I'd, just, I'd do anything for them, whatever they ask of me? What kind of people do they tend to be? Probably, if you're like me and you've had the same kinds of people in your life that I have, the people that I have that greatest affection for, that I love the most, that I would do anything for, are the people who have been willing to do anything for me, who have given of their time and their love and their effort unreservedly, to me, 
They've been generous. They've been kind. They have been loving. The, the leech, the, the parasite, may be able to extract some blood from people for a time in this life, but what they receive from their fellow man will be given grudgingly, not liberally. It, it is going to have to be squeezed out of them, isn't it? That person that is, is trying to, to use you in this way, that is trying to leech off of you, maybe they're effective at it, but you're sure not enjoying it. And you're sure not going to give more than they are trying to squeeze out of you. And much more importantly, any reward that they might gain is strictly limited to here and now. I think of what Jesus says in Matthew 6. In delivering the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking there about the first several verses of Matthew 6, those who give, those who provide alms, those who do charitable deeds. And he says not to do that with a lot of you know, grand gestures and a lot of flourish as you're doing that, because those who give in the wrong way should expect that the only reward they'll receive is the praise from men. And, and that's really more of a, a broad principle, a general principle, that when we give or receive with only here in mind, with only material, ultimately useless things in mind, that's the only kind of reward you get back in turn, a material and useless one. On the other hand, think of another proverb. Chapter 19 and verse 17 he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. That he, and the proverb is God that he's talking about, he will pay back what has been given. The way of the leech is the most ineffective, short-sighted, foolish way to actually receive anything good from this life and certainly in the next. Instead, if I am generous, if I am giving, if I show that love towards all who are in such great need of it, I should expect and can expect that that will be returned. That that will be returned to me. And certainly so, Paul in his life was able to look kind of reaching the, the latter stages of his life in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, knowing that he had lived for God, not himself, he expected, as he says, the crown of righteousness would be his. What more would a person want to, to gain out of this life? What more could we hope for at the end of life than to have the good opinion of God, than to know that we have pleased him? There is only one way we will reach that point, and it is not through living for self. It is not for so tightly clinging on to everything that we think we have and extracting every last bit that we can from everyone else around us. That is not the way to the crown. It's a way to loneliness and ruin and bitterness from all the people around us. If you actually want to receive good things in life, be generous with everything that you have and, and know that that will be repaid. This way also reveals a lack of faith. It's not really surprising to us to find the way of the leech as we're describing it this morning. It's not really surprising to find that in people of the world. By that I mean those who, who are not followers of Christ, those who are not his disciples, those who are not his people. We expect to find that in the world, don't we? We expect the world at, at large Humanity in general will often show itself to be mercenary and to be selfish and to be materialistic and to be idolatrous and covetous and greedy and all those other, all those other terrible adjectives that we might find in this way. That's expected. But it really fits poorly on a professing Christian because at its root, this problem that we're dealing with this, this way of the leech betrays a fundamental lack of faith. It's essentially and, and ultimately admitting that I don't really trust God. I don't really trust God to do what he has said. Do you believe that God will provide what you need? 
you believe that that, that that promise that he makes, or the statement that he would make in observation, I've not seen the righteous begging bread. I, I've not seen a, a child of mine who will not be taken care of. Do you believe that God will provide for your needs ultimately, or do you feel the need to hoard as much as you can? Because I'm in this for myself, and I'm the only one who can look out for myself. Do you believe that eternal life with God awaits you at the end of this life? Or are you not so sure about that? And so this might be your one and only shot at true enjoyment of life. So get out there and have fun and let everybody else take care of themselves and don't spend a moment worrying about someone else or their happiness or their needs and how you might help. Go live your life to the fullest because this is all you've got. Do you believe that the Lord loves you and that the Lord himself, God, the creator of all things, is attentive to you? Or are you so unsure of something that fundamental that you feel the need to hold everyone else in your life as an emotional hostage so that they'll give you their time and attention? And I have to extract every last bit out of, out of them because God surely doesn't care for me. That's a lack of faith. If we are constantly saying, as the leech does, give, 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 never say enough, never be satisfied. On the other hand, Paul, as we've been comparing, he could live and serve the way that he did. He could make that statement that we began with, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. I, I can do that with a clean conscience and with all joy, spend even my life for your sakes because he trusted God, because he knew God would reward him, because he knew God would provide for him, because he knew, as we mentioned a moment ago from Philippians 4, that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. If that is where our faith is, why would we be afraid to give of ourselves? Why would we be afraid to go without so that another might have? Why would we be afraid to go out on a limb of service and love and compassion? If our faith is where it should be, our hearts will be where they should be. That service will follow. Ultimately and finally, we'd say this morning that this way of the leech fails, completely fails to reflect the character of our God, the, the nature of our God, his attributes, his, his personality, we might say, which as a Christian, I am, I am very interested in. We are called to be like him. We are called especially to be like his son, who is the image of God. The exact imprint of God was displayed in Christ. And I am told to be like him. Father, like Son, I am told to walk in those footsteps, to be like God. What is his character? What has he done? What is his disposition towards us? Sometimes we think of what God receives or is meant to receive from mankind. You'd have passages like the, the praise offered in Revelation. To him be glory and honor and dominion and power and all of the, the exalting praises that they are giving to Jehovah. And that, that is accurate. Those things do belong to him, and it should be in our hearts to magnify his name, to make him great through what we, what small, meager gifts we can provide. The sacrifices, the praise, the, the, the honor that we give to him and to his name. Those are appropriate. Those are apt. But if you really begin to think, adding up maybe the, the balance of value of what God has given and what he receives from men, which one more accurately shows his true nature? What he receives or what he gives? All right, so here is what God gets out of the deal, so to speak. Our sacrifice, our praise, our obedience, the love that we offer to him, the, the glory that he gets from seeing his creation obey him is something that honors and glorifies him. Well, that's, those things are good. Again, they're, they're appropriate, they're apt, they're what we should do. 
What has God given? What was his input into the situation? Well, we would need to begin with creation of all things. Any beautiful sunrise that you see, any great mountain that you have ever looked at, is there because God made it and he gave it to you to enjoy. Any family member that you love, any happy time around a dinner table that you've enjoyed, any uh, wonderful holiday meeting that you've had, a family reunion that you've enjoyed, where all the people that you love most in this world were able to come together, that time was enjoyed because God made those people, and he made you, and he put you in each other's lives, and allowed you to have that friendship, that time to build up that friendship, and that love, and all of those things. So, we would begin with existence itself, nature itself, the ability to appreciate those beautiful things and those beautiful moments that we can enjoy. God has invested his love in the world. If we're talking about giving and receiving and what that means, everyone, well, really everyone in, in this continent at least probably would be able to quote John three sixteen from memory, God so loved the world that he gave. That's the expression of how great God's love was that he gave. That's how we understand who he is, that he invested the love of himself, that he gave his son so that mankind could be saved. I've I've mentioned in a sermon several, well, it's been several months ago by now, all this extra enlightenment and wisdom, of course, that I've acquired from fatherhood. It's, It's amazing how... You know, how much smarter I am now. I know you've all noticed that. But you just, you become a dad and you just learn it all, overnight almost. Kidding, of course. But some things do become much clearer. Some things are really crystallized. And the most powerful one for me has been what a passage like that actually means. Because I now have what, what God had in some sense, that child. That, that only child in some measure. And there is, there is not a way on earth that I can picture sacrificing her for anything. I can't imagine. It's, it's almost physically painful to think about. And yet God so loved the world that he gave his unique son. Has God given? Has he provided? Has he offered? Has he sacrificed? He gives forgiveness. He gives salvation. He gives hope. He gives security. Every good thing that a person could possibly hope to have in this life or the next, we have only because of that God. So, that's one side of the equation. On the other is what we give to him. Again, which is... Which is winning out in that balance? Which side of that teeter-totter is going to go down and which will go up? If you at all take seriously the admonition to be godly, if you at all take seriously the admonition that we are to be Christ-like, you have a clear path in front of you. You must give. You must sacrifice. You must offer. You must love. You must provide. You must do all of those things that God has done. Surely we will not be able to do so in the measure that he has. Nowhere near. But we are called to be like him. And in this way, if we can see the great giver before us, spending so much to assure that our needs are, net, our, our needs are met while receiving so little from us, and receiving us with mercy and with patience. How could we possibly be the leech that says, give, give? No, God, it's not enough. No, God, it's it's never enough. No, to my friends and to my brethren, you haven't done enough for me. You must do more for me. Instead, if I am like my Father, if I am like my God, I would say, I will spend, I will be spent for your souls. 
I will do whatever I can, whatever I am called to do, in order to see good come to those that I love. That is the way of our God. And this morning, that is the only way that we can recommend to any who would be listening. Again, with any lesson like this, we hope we are saying it's a problem another person has. I like when I can preach a lesson or hear a lesson and feel like, oh good, that didn't have anything to do with me. I, I don't struggle with that. I don't, I don't have that problem. Those are very few and far between, and usually we're fooling ourselves when we say that. But I know this morning. Although I am talking to generous people, loving people, I am, I am talking to, to many people this morning who are part of a, a great family here at Woodland Hills. And you have, for longer than I have been around, you have loved each other and given for each other and spent for each other. We need to continue doing that. But I also know that within us there is that seed that Satan can exploit. There is that that part of man that wants to glorify himself. There is that part of us that thinks, I am what is most important. Whether it is my happiness, my personal comfort at this moment, whatever it might be, we see that as the primary part. And for the Christian, we must eradicate that part of us. And follow after the footsteps of Jesus Christ himself. And this morning... If you have the need to obey the call that our God has made to each one of us, begin a life of following him, as we talked about in our first hour this morning, the Apostle Peter being called to follow Jesus, that, that is what we each must do. And if you can begin that journey this morning, for the first time acknowledging your faith in the Lord to save, that he alone can save, you need to obey him. In response to that faith, do so this morning. Don't waste another day. Don't waste another hour in pondering over that. Count the cost. Understand what will be asked of you, but then make that decision that you will follow Jesus Christ. It is the only way that leads to salvation. There is none other. If we can help in that way in your obedience to the gospel through being baptized into Christ, through repenting of your sin, in any way that we can assist, we stand very ready and willing to spend